Good afternoon or good morning if it applies. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gilla, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. So glad to have you with us for today's program. Uh, for those of you joining us on the Zoom webinar, we can't see or hear you and we also can't call on raised hands, but we're loving the greetings that you're sending in and we want you to be a part of this conversation. So please do use the chat feature throughout the presentation to share your comments and questions. We'll be taking note of this. Um, I'm joined by colleagues who are going to make sure to represent your voice in the room as the conversation goes on. I want to welcome anybody joining on YouTube. We are not able to moderate chat through YouTube, though. Before we get started on today's program, I just want to let you know what we have coming up the next two Tuesdays on Open Classroom. So one week from today on September 28th, Professor Suzanne Breyer from Cornell University is giving us a talk on inclusive perspectives, building disability inclusive work environments. And then on um, Tuesday, October 5th, Associate Professor of the Practice here at the Brown School, Lorianne Carter, is giving a special 90 minute presentation on what's happening inside the teenage brain and why does it matter. Registration is open for both of those programs. Everything we do here at Open Classroom is free and open to all. We'd love to have you come back for anything and everything that we have coming up. But for today, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Leopoldo Cabasa. He's the director of the PhD program in social work here at the Brown School and the co-director of the Center for Mental Health Services Research. And it's in that second capacity that he's here as he and his team have made this program possible. Please take us away, Leo. Thank you, Janet. It's great to see you. Welcome, bienvenidos, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first Center for Mental Health Services Research monthly seminar series for the 2021-2022 academic year. Uh, as Janet mentioned, I'm Dr. Cabasa, the co-director, along with Byron Powell of the CMHSR. And joining us today, we have Nancy Perez Flores, one of our great social work doctoral students, and NIMH T32 fellow who will be assisting us today in the Q&I section for our program. And Nancy is also a co-investigator of our new Latinx collaborative to reduce stigma and improve mental literacy, who's co-sponsoring this event. Uh, this event today, as I mentioned, is being co-sponsored by the Washington University Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Equity, CRE2, uh, and the Latinx and Latin American Race and Ethnicity Research Unit, as well as uh, Brown School Open Classroom. So today is my great honor to start this year's monthly seminar series commemorating the Hispanic Heritage Month with a great talk from a great colleague uh, and mentor and someone who I, I really appreciate learning from his work and his passion for this, uh, for, for this topic in particular, Dr. Steven Lopez, uh, who's gonna present today uh, a talk uh, titled Towards Reducing the Duration of Untreated Psychosis, the Case of US Latinos. Uh, Dr. Lopez, a professor of psychology and social work at the University of Southern California, he has dedicated 39 years uh, as an academic clinical psychologist to improving the mental health services for Latinx community. Uh, Dr. Lopi is a leader in this field and has led the way for many innovations uh, with our community. He has developed programs to teach people in Mexico and the United States to identify early signs of serious mental illness so that they can receive prompt care. He has taught mental health professionals to work effectively with culturally diverse communities, especially the Latinx community. And, and for 15 years, he directed a great research training program in Mexico in which 131 students from across the United States participated. In all of this effort, he strives to promote a conversation about mental health, the role of culture, and effective care. Uh, so for, with further ado, uh, I give you Dr. Steve, Lo Steve Lopez, and we're very excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Cabasa, and thank you, Nancy. And thank you, Janet, and also the Brown School and the Center for Mental Health Services Research for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to connect with Leo Cabasa. I've really enjoyed the, the times that we've uh, been able to interact a bit. Um, but it's also a pleasure to be uh, here at WashU. I've, been, I've given a couple of talks at WashU in the past, and uh, I wish I was there in person, maybe catch a ball game of the Cardinals, uh, but uh, we'll have to do that another day. All right, but today we're gonna to talk about reducing the duration of untreated psychosis. But before we do that, let me give you a little bit of additional background to me. Um, I think this is important because it puts into perspective and context uh, kind of my research. So I was born in Tucson, Arizona, and we're fifth generation Tucsonans. My, my sister, who still lives in Tucson, had children, so they're sixth generation. So the Lopez family began in Tucson when it was 
uh, at Presidio de San Agustin, the fort of St. Augustine, and still part of Mexico. Uh, my uh, parents were bilingual. Uh, and for example, my, my grandmother, my dad's mom, only spoke Spanish. And so my dad grew up speaking Spanish. And my mom was more bilingual. Um, in terms of her youth, but so they didn't speak Spanish to us. They only spoke English. The only times they spoke Spanish is when they were fighting or when they wanted to be intimate. So it was a secret language that we had little access to. But I took it in, in, in high school, junior high school, high school and college. And I went to the Claremont colleges in the early seventies. And this was the kind of a height of civil rights movement. Black study centers were being uh, developed. Chicano study centers were being developed. So people would ask me, Steve Lopez, who, what are you? What, you know, what, essentially, what's your ethnicity? Where do you fit in? What, what's, your, what's your main identity? And I, in Tucson, we consider ourselves Mexican-Americans, but that didn't resonate so well with some folks. Uh, some folks thought me as too white. Um, and anyways, uh, so this idea of ethnicity and where I fit in played an important role. My junior year, I decided to go to Mexico and I wanted to become Mexican. That was my main goal, how to become Mexican. I bought myself some huaraches. I got these uh, denim flowered shirts and I just hung out with Mexicanos and I practiced my double R's, ferrocarril, ferrocarril, ferrocarril. Traveled throughout Mexico, buses, train, uh, took a history class, anthropology class, uh, literature class. And I learned a lot more about Mexican, but I came back home and wasn't Mexican. I was a fifth generation Mexican American who was much more familiar with issues of culture and ethnicity. And that influenced my interest in research. And so for my senior thesis, I did a paper on ethnicity and clinical management. And that launched my interest in bringing a personal kind of thing about what is ethnicity and culture to, to my academic interests. Uh, and so uh, that's been my goal is to really think carefully about culture and ethnicity and how to bring it to understanding mental health and how to help people address mental health kinds of concerns. All right, so that's a little bit more about me. Uh, now let me introduce the topic of this duration of untreated psychosis with a case. And uh, for a number of years, we did research on families and the idea of expressed emotion. Uh, Amy Wiseman and Adrian Aguilera and Nick Brightborn were some of the students who worked with me on this and have had, and since developed really strong careers. But, but I'll never forget this one case. Uh, let's call him Ruben. Uh, Ruben's uh, sister was the informant in this case. And uh, she was 31 years old and she was a nurse. And she told about Ruben, who as a child was on the aggressive side, real close to the father. Father dies in early adolescence. He then becomes more aggressive. Family's concerned that he's uh, hanging out with the wrong crowd. So they send him to Europe. He had a brother in Europe. Uh, oftentimes you hear this story in the Mexico. They send him to Guatemala. They send him back home because of the negative influences that they family see of their adolescent children, particularly men. And uh, so he spends a year in Europe, comes back home and still is on the aggressive sides, not really, not going to school by the way. So they send him back to Europe uh, and then they come back, he comes back home after two years. They finally figure out something mental, something about his mental health is going on. Uh, sister uh, has him evaluated by one of his uh, physician colleagues. And he says he could be, he's not right quite criteria, meet criteria for involuntary hospitalization, uh, but he needs mental health. Finally, they convince him to go to a psychiatric hospital. The mother then intervenes. The mother says, Mijo, my son isn't crazy and took him out of the hospital. So bottom line, it took him four years with the onset when we really reflected on it, it took him four years to get help. So if you think about it, that time, let's say 16, 17 was his onset. Those critical years were lost, developing relationships, same sex, other sex and uh, relationships, school, uh, work, uh, family relations, that was lost. So, so when we talk about uh, that period of time between when the onset occurred to when he got treatment, that's what we refer to the duration of untreated psychosis, that time period from the illness onset to when he first starts getting treatment. And if you have a longer duration of untreated psychosis, you're gonna have worse outcomes. That's the assumption behind this and there's some evidence to support it. 
So we're going to look at the ratio of untreated psychosis, particularly for Latinx community. So today I'm going to critically examine the initiatives to support early psychosis treatment. I'm a very strong advocate of the need for early psychosis treatment, no question about it. But we've got a lot, we've got a long ways to go to have equal access to these services. We have a long ways to go. So we have to critically examine these initiatives. And I'm gonna present some of our research on bringing early treatment for psychosis to Latinos uh, on both sides of the US-Mexican border and talk about the importance of reaching out to underserved communities for early psychosis. So those are my objectives. Now, uh, there's a lot of about the treatment and intervention for psychotic disorders and schizophrenia today. When I was a graduate student, if I had this impression that if you develop schizophrenia, you're developing a chronic condition. You're gonna end up in a state hospital and spend decades of your life uh, in this chronic condition and, and uh, in some cases be warehoused. Um, um, but now there's hope. There's hope that with early intervention, either at the prodromal stage before the symptoms actually fully express themselves or immediately after the initial onset, there's hope that we can eliminate the disabling condition of schizophrenia and other psychotic conditions. Schizophrenia doesn't have to be a chronic illness, no question about it. Um, and, and, and think about it. If we could have, if Ruben could have been treated, let's say a month or two, he could have gone to school. He could have been gainfully employed. He could have developed relationships, long-term relationships. Instead, what happened to him, he wasn't on a positive trajectory. So it can reduce considerable burden to individuals, to their families, and to society overall. Um, so there's a lot of optimism. Here's some of the evidence to support that. One are these, quote, naturalistic studies that just study the duration of untreated psychosis, that time period that I mentioned, and relate it to symptomatology or relate it to social functioning, work, uh, relationships, schooling. And what they find is that the longer duration of untreated psychosis is associated with worse symptomatology and worse social functioning. This was Marshall and Perkins were the first two meta-analyses, but in more recent studies, uh, more recent meta-analysis continue to support this association. It's not, a, it's not a really strong association, but it's it's a signal that clearly that's the case. Uh, and the other piece of information, that the uh, other data to support this optimism, uh, the idea is, uh, the other piece of the data is that the TIP study. These are Norwegians uh, and also folks in, in Denmark collaborated on the TIP study. And essentially what they did is that they provided an early intervention service in three locales. One was in Oslo, Norway. One was in Stavanger, uh, Norway. And the other was in Copenhagen, Denmark. All three had the early intervention teams. Okay, early intervention. So they knew the importance of recognizing psychosis early on in adolescence. They knew the importance of reaching out to the home and to bring folks back if they dropped out of care. They, they brought in multiple uh, uh, interventions, evidence-based interventions. But the critical difference was in Roglin, I said Stavanger. Uh, Stavanger, I think is a city in Roglin, a county. Roglin, they had a multifaceted campaign. So they got, they had things on schizophrenia in the newspaper, in the radio and television. They go to the schools, they go to health clinics and they just had this massive widespread campaign. And what they found, and that was considered the experimental site. And what they found is that the over a four year period, uh, they assessed the duration of untreated psychosis in these three uh, locales. And they found that in the control condition, this is in, uh, Den in Copenhagen and Oslo. The duration of untreated psychosis was 16 weeks, but in the experimental condition in Roglin County, they were able to reduce it to five weeks, five weeks. I mean, can you imagine here in the United States that the duration of untreated psychosis was 16 weeks? That would be wonderful. Uh, but uh, the point here, and then also in a follow-up, a 10-year follow-up, they showed that some of these effects uh, persisted. Uh, the recovery rate of folks in Roglin was much better than the recovery rate 
in the control sites. So these two pieces of evidence, one, the duration of untreated psychosis relates to clinical symptoms and social function, and also this intervention study, community intervention with the multifaceted campaign, demonstrate that the duration of untreated psychosis, one, is malleable, you can, you can adjust it, and with the hope that a reduced duration of untreated psychosis can lead to positive, uh, positive outcomes. All right, so in the United States, this has been translated into something called coordinated specialty care programs. Uh, Professor Cavasa works with uh, Lisa Dixon on, on track, which is this coordinated specialty care program in, in New York. And the core aspect of the CSC uh, is this idea of a recovery orientation versus an illness orientation. Uh, that's, that's the core part. So if you're interested in recovery, you're interested in supportive employment right, and education, uh, not just reducing symptomatology. So support employment education is part of it, resilience focused individual or group therapy is part of it, family relations are important as well. As, and then also, of course, medication management. Um, so the US, the early interventions that we saw in Norway and other parts of Europe, I would say Europe and Australia have been the leaders, we've been the followers in this. Uh, but uh, coordinated specialty care has gotten a lot of attention in the United States. And the evidence to support this is the Ray study, uh, John Kane, uh, very well-known psychiatrist, psychopharmacologist carried this out. Uh, it was a cluster randomization clinical trial of over 400 individuals with first episode psychosis, largely schizophrenia. They had two conditions in this clinical trial. One was a coordinated specialty care, they referred to it as Navigate. And the other were the treatment as usual within the community clinic care, and that's CC. The important point of this is it wasn't just in New York City at one clinic, but it was across 21 states in 34 community mental health treatment centers. So the idea was not to get this very controlled study in a department of psychiatry or psychology or mental health center, but to really have regular clinicians within regular settings carrying this out and seeing if it works. And this is the main finding. Uh, here on the left side, you see the quality of, of life um, scale. So looking at social function, here you have the symptomatology, uh, the PANS, positive and negative symptomatology. I'm gonna focus on the quality of life scale. And the orange circles reflect the results for the navigate or the coordinated, coordinated specialty care. And the green diamonds reflect the uh, community care. And what you see over time period that the quality of life improves in both conditions, whether you have navigate the coordinated specialty care or if you have the community care. So one key point is that, uh, that you're seeing, uh, oh, the other thing is, uh, it, but the important point here is the duration of untreated psychosis. So this effect of the clinical trial is moderated by their duration of untreated psychosis. So those who have less than 74 weeks, so they did a median split, median was 74 weeks in this sample of 404 people. Um, and those with less than 74 weeks had better benefits, better outcomes than those with greater than 74 weeks. See that? Uh, you see the quality of life much greater than there. So overall, Navigate or critical uh, coordinated specialty care did better than the community clinic, but it was moderated by duration of untreated psychosis. So the conclusions from the RACE study, and the RACE study is an important study here in the United States. It's consistent with other studies in Europe that did early interventions, but one key point is that it was successfully implemented in real, real world settings. That's hard to say, real world settings. And it was shown to be effective. But the other point that I wanna to bring to your attention is that John Kane and his colleagues said, wrote, prolonged duration of untreated psychosis is an issue of national importance. Reducing duration of untreated psychosis from current levels of greater than a year to the recommended standard of less than three months should be a major focus of applied research efforts. So the reason why that statement, why he says that is that 
no longer do we just see duration of untreated psychosis related to symptomatology or social function, but it's related to, to the treatment as well. If we want to optimize treatment, let's get folks in early so that they can maximally benefit from interventions. All right. So that's why that's an important point. Okay. Now, the United States uh, has been backing the coordinated specialty care. In fact, SAMHSA, starting in 2014, provided block grants to states for early intervention programs. States can get more money, set aside funds, if they develop an early intervention program. It started out at 5%, then it increased to 10%. Talking about millions of dollars can go towards early intervention if that's something that you want. Uh, and uh, a recent or the most recent paper that I've seen is 48 states now have early intervention programs uh, and, and, uh, across, uh, across our country. The other policy implication is the National Institute of Mental Health is very much strongly supported coordinated specialty care. In fact, they had a couple of, uh, at least that I'm familiar with, funding opportunities for the EpiNet. And the EpiNet refers to early psychosis interventions, I think, if I remember the uh, acronym correctly. And the idea is, you know, we don't have social medicine. So it's hard to get databases and clinics and centers to coordinate data. But the uh, Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, came up with this concept of the learning healthcare system. And the learning healthcare system is actually saying, let's pool our data in real time so that we can inform services today or so that we can communicate across clinics and centers and states so we can improve our services. And also we can use it for research purposes. So these regional networks of services is something that NIMH is developing for coordinated specialty care. The idea is an investment now can pay off great dividends in the future to enhance things. So I'm a big believer in coordinated specialty care, early psychosis intervention, but there's some limitations. One is it's hard to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. It's really hard to do. Uh, there was one review in, I think it was 2000. 11, Lloyd, uh, and I had a hyphenated name, but the more recent one is Oliver, a meta-analysis of 16 controlled studies. And essentially, when you look at the effect size, it's close to zero. And he argued the principal find of this meta-analysis is a lack of overall summary evidence for any beneficial impact of controlled interventions for reducing the duration of untreated psychosis. It's hard to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. Another limitation, is that this shouldn't surprise most of us, is that if you look at his review paper, all of the interventions to reduce duration of untreated psychosis were in high income countries. None were in lower or middle income countries. These are the list of the countries. Um, I went uh, to the site to see how they define the different countries. I think it's the World Health Organization. I forgot which one, but they're all high income countries. The other thing, is that within these high income countries, they make reference to diversity within their communities, yes, but there's little attention to modifying or considering the cultural context of their messaging. Uh, the best study that I came across was Chong and his colleagues, uh, or it could be her, uh, maybe it is, uh, Su and Chong. Chong and her colleagues, uh, is that they did a docudrama, uh, kind of a soap opera series about serious mental illness and about the importance of early psychosis. They held the forums in English and Chinese. Um, and they also, the docudrama was translated into their four languages within that country. But there's no discussion of, might you adapt the content in ways that make sense for Tamil speaking or Malay speaking or Chinese speaking versus English, which I might understand is a dominant language, language in Singapore. So, uh, and then the fourth limitation of these efforts to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis and also the focus on early intervention, we seem to overlook the importance of campaigns. The emphasis has been on testing coordinated specialty clinics, building clinics, evidence-based treatment. But the main finding of TIPS 
wasn't the early intervention. Those were in the three locales. The main finding was the importance of the multifaceted campaign. So I think the assumption in coordinated specialty care is drawing on a uh, baseball metaphor from Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. If you build the coordinated specialty care, people will come. Well, what if you're an underserved community? What if you don't speak language? What if you're an immigrant? What if you don't have resources? You're less likely to make access of those services. And so what's needed? Campaigns to get the word out in terms of the importance of recognizing these kinds of issues to get them into mental health services. So those are the limitations. And why is coordinated specialty care not enough? Uh, we draw on Lloyd Drogler and Dharma Cortez's work. They say that people identify the symptoms within the families, then they go through their social networks of extended families, as well as um, uh, schools, healthcare providers, criminal justice system, uh, and then they get into the mental health system. But getting into the mental health system is their own pathway as well. Folks enter, they can drop out, they can initiate treatment, they can drop out, or, and they can finally adhere to treatment and then drop out. So it's a pathway in and of itself. So the coordinated specialty care is great with regard to the mental health system. Max Birchwood has this important paper in the United Kingdom that pointed out that one of the barriers to getting early intervention was the mental health system itself. The, the folks in specialty mental health care, not with early intervention, not with that special training in terms of early intervention, they wouldn't recognize psychosis in an adolescent. They wouldn't follow up with outreach to go into the community and bring the person back that didn't show up. And so coordinated specialty care uh, can do that but it's not gonna help families recognize it. It's not going to uh, teach the criminal justice uh, folks in that system or healthcare professionals and the like. So we need campaigns to address the general public and the general public and professionals. Coordinated specialty care is important to address the barriers within regular mental health systems, but it's not gonna address this. All right, so our work is, uh, primarily uh, with the Latinx community. And one, I think another limitation, I didn't mention this, is that there's not enough attention to high risk groups for prolonged DUP. If we identified the high risk groups, we might be able to get more bang for our buck. In other words, go with those folks that are most likely to suffer from prolonged duration. Can we reach out and make a difference in their lives? In the Latinx community is the largest, quote, minority group in the United States and especially in California. Uh, and uh, Margarita Alegria in her work in National Epidemiologic Research points out that folks of uh, adults of Mexican origin, Spanish speaking immigrants are the ones that are least likely to make use of mental health services. And this, this was not with psychotic disorders, this was substance use, uh, depression, anxiety. Uh, and um, so Latinos are at, uh, at high risk for a prolonged DUP. The other point is that they, we have evidence to indicate that they have low psychosis literacy. So there's a growing literature called mental health literacy. It's not reading and writing about mental health. It's about being able to recognize the illness, being able to take action. It's being able to read your prescription, follow through with treatment. It's a broader term. Well, we've carried out research to assess people's psychosis literacy in the context of literacy. I wanna do a little uh, engagement piece here and, and play a video, a three and a half minute video. Most research that assesses psychosis literacy and mental health literacy provide a, uh, read a case. It's like a case report. John uh, started uh, developing kind of like the case of Ruben that I mentioned. And then they ask, they ask, you know, what, what's, what does John have? What does Jane have? They sometimes manipulate the gender. Um, Jorm is the prominent researcher in this area. Um, and they identify high psychosis literacy if they use the term schizophrenia or psychosis. Well, we do it a little different. Um, we present a video clip and I'm gonna show that to you right now. Uh, let's see if I can get out of this.
And as Steven is putting there, if there's questions, please put them in the chat function. We will we will use them later uh, to, okay. to do a Q&A. Looks like I'm not able to exit my PowerPoint for some reason. So we'll have to skip on the video clip, unfortunately. All right, um, that's okay. You might have to do. stop screen sharing and then reshare. Okay. Thank you, Janet. If you want to. Yeah, thank you, Janet. I don't, uh, let's see. Let's, let's go ahead and skip. Um, uh, but uh, here's the data. Uh, what we do is we show this video clip. Que uh, tiene Elsa or what does Elsa have? What's up with Elsa? And in Elsa, she presents uh, a comment about her cousin who's named Elsa. That's, uh, it's, a, it's a monologue. And she talks about Elsa having uh, problems in a relationship, uh, recent breakup, having difficulties in the re uh, family tensions for different reasons. But embedded in this are delusions, hallucinations, and thought disorder. So they have social kinds of issues, but as well, psychotic symptoms. And then we ask our participants. Uh, we've done this in the community. And in this case, we're talking about folks with first episode psychosis and their caregivers. The dark, the dark bars are people with a first episode psychosis. And then the light bars are their caregivers. And so only 33% of the consumers with first episode identify at least one of those three symptoms of hallucination, possible hallucinations, delusions, or consensual disorganization. Only one of them, I mean, only a third identify at least one. Caregivers, about 50%. But then you ask them, ¿Qué es una enfermedad mental grave? What's a serious mental illness? Only 10% mention delusions. And they don't have to use the word delusions. They can just say when they have these certain beliefs or they think that somebody's out to hurt them. Uh, only a little over, uh, about 10% uh, reflect on disorganized speech, but the one that's most prominent in people's minds are hallucinations. But you see that again, persons with first episode cycle, less than 50% recognize that it's hallucinations. And then less than 10% use schizophrenia and psychosis. And so uh, the point here is that these are folks, caregivers and folks, first episode psychosis, almost all of them in mental health services are not very, quote, literate with regard to psychosis. So that's another reason why low psychosis literacy, why the Latinx community might be at high risk for a prolonged DUP. All right, so the focus of our campaign is funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. We're very thankful for that. Five year, six years of funding with a no cost extension. Our main goal was to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis in a Latinx community uh, through a campaign we did not work with a coordinated specialty care. We actually did not work closely with especially mental health care. I mean, we did, but our team was outside the clinic. Uh, it'd be much better to have folks within the clinic for the most part. Um, so we did not work with a coordinated specialty care. Now, uh, we wanted to do a campaign. Well, one of the things that we considered very carefully was what's the guidance? What kind of guidance can we get from the literature in developing this campaign? very little uh, with regard to psychosis. What was most helpful to us was this review paper by NOAR, N-O-A-R, 2006. And it's the principles of successful campaigns. Some of the principles are doing formative research to check out whether your messaging actually is efficacious, uh, efficacious and effective. Uh, segmentation, think about the specific audience and gearing your message using novel, creative ways of presenting this information. One of the things that I see in some of these campaigns, they use the word schizophrenia, they use the word psychosis. Why not use the terms that people use in their communities as opposed to imposing these clinical or professional terms, and instead use the terms that they use. Um, so th those are some of the guidance. Uh, and also do process evaluations, assess whether or not people receive the message. Most of the research is they put out the campaign and then they see if there's a duration of untreated psychosis. Well, how about checking out whether or not they receive the message or to what extent they receive the message? Uh, all right. 
So uh, assumption that can so another key component is that uh, the assumption is that these campaigns increase the psychosis literacy, uh, but there's no evidence that these campaigns actually reduce uh, or enhance psychosis literacy. I think I'm repeating myself. All right, we drew heavily on the Health Literacy um, Institute of Medicine. A report uh, which is not just about mental health, it's, it's all kinds of health issues. Uh, we drew on Linda Garo, a colleague of mine when I was at UCLA in anthropology, and May Ye, some of her important work out of San Diego. Came up with this important model. I want to thank Leo Cabasa because he was a young faculty member at uh, USC, uh, and I showed him a draft of this paper that came out in 2009, and he, he was supportive in a critical way and said, Where's the theory? Uh, and we, I really hadn't elaborated on the theoretical concepts that we were considering at that time. And so the idea is, if you have health knowledge, then it's more likely that you're going to make an illness attribution, and then you're more likely to, to seek help. On the other hand, if you don't have that health knowledge, you might attribute things more to other issues, like Rubin. It's the bad influence of his, his, uh, his friends. That's the problem. It's not an illness. Just got to get him out of this place and they're not seeking help. So that's the simple model that we use. The other thing is that we tried to make this for our audience. So we came up with uh, an acronym and a mnemonic device, Usen la clave para detectar la enfermedad mental grave. And la clave I owe to my wife, Leticia, uh, who's here someplace in my home, uh, taking care of her mom, my suegra, my mother-in-law, who's with us, 93, 94-year-old. Uh, we're fortunate she's, she's still in our lives. Um, but I told Leticia, I want to come up with a way, an easy way of remembering psychosis, something like si cosas is psychosis. Si cosas is psychosis. I thought that was a clever idea. And she says, That's, that sucks. That's my supportive wife for you. Um, why? Because it's for Spanish speaking, right? You have si, it's a, okay, I get it. So she took the ruse to SAR, she took her Velasquez bilingual dictionary and went to the uh, uh, bedroom, came back an hour and a half later. And I gave her all the terms that I could think of of uh, psychotic symptoms. And she came up with clave. She said, this isn't so good, but this is all I can do. And clave is creencias falsas, false beliefs, delusions, lenguaje desorganizado, conceptual disorganization, Alucinaciones, what kind of hallucinaciones? Ver cosas que no existen, escuchar sonidos o ruidos que no existen. Usen la clave. Uh, so that's our acronym. And I had a cartoonist draw these because in Mexico City, if you ever go to Metro in Mexico City, you don't need to read or write to stop at the different paradas, the different stops. They have General Anaya uh, is a picture of a Napoleonic figure. Uh, right there, or Zocalo, you see the serpent in the mouth of the eagle on top of the nopales or the cactus. So we I wanted to come up with images and we have that. And we use La Clave uh, throughout our brochures and our website and in our presentations and in our videos. We also developed a toolkit um, for resources for non-professionals. The idea being early on, we want to not have this professionally based, we want to give it to people who can and uh, present it. And, and so we came up with a live version with PowerPoint. We draw on clips from Chespirito, Cantinflas, Mana to illustrate some of these concepts. We put that uh, live presentation into a PowerPoint uh, and, and went to the studio and, and put it in La Clase. We call it La Clase, it's a talking head. We went to, uh, we worked with promotores in Puebla and we went to meet with folks and they didn't have electrical outlet in their room where we were meeting with folks. So fortunately, it was uh, we had a long extension cord and went to the bedroom. We said, we need something without loose, without electricity. And we came up with a portfolio or a flip chart to communicate. And then the one that we use the most now is La Pelicula. We have a narrative film, 15 minutes. That's easy. You can watch the La Clase and the film if you go to our website, usilaclave.com. You can watch the film or the class A with usilaclave.com. All right, we've evaluated each of these toolkits. Uh, for example, in, in Mexico and the United States, um, for example, we uh, used the health science uh, students in, in La Boap, uh, a public university in Mexico, and uh, we randomly assigned them with uh, 
Survey Gizmo, I think they have another name now. Uh, we assigned them either to a TED talk on social ecology, to the classe, or to the movie. And then we showed our what's up with Elsa at the end and asked them the questions. So what's going on with Elsa, what's up? Social world, the difficulty in relationships, problems with the family, not about symptoms. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not about symptoms. But if they had the movie or the class, nearly 80% made a reference to illness, psychosis. So this is an example of testing our toolkit. Um, so that was a basic- Where five minutes? Where the five, five minutes, minutes. Got, it. got it. Thank you, Leo. Uh, we then developed a, uh, we targeted this particular community. It's uh, in Los Angeles. We did so because we worked with all of you mental, all the medical center where Alex Kapelowitz, our psychiatrist is the chief of psychiatry. He's also the medical director of the outpatient clinic. This was our, our, our targeted community. Uh, our main hypotheses were to uh, see a reduction in the duration of untreated psychosis. We had 16 month baseline, 24 month campaign, 16 month post campaign. And we expected the foreign born to be having lower literacy. All right, we reached out to many places. We went to swap meets, Dianguis. Uh, we went to health fairs. This is Rosalba and Eva, who are community educators. Uh, Eva's from Puerto Rico, Rosalba's from Mexico. This is a congressman who visited us. We went to a lot of uh, churches. This is a CCD class on Saturday, uh, ministers, health professionals, mental health professionals, criminal justice system. We're in the newspapers. Uh, we're in, uh, uh, in television, radio. Uh, we were on billboards. These are the different locales of our billboards. Here's an example of our billboard bench. And here's our website. Uh, the message was delivered. I, I won't tell you the thousands of people that we connected with. We had a 1-800 number. We counted the number of unduplicated calls uh, to the clinic through this 1-800 number and saw bumps in the number when we did our different campaign elements. We asked the participants if they've ever heard of La Clave when they were enrolled in the study and nine of 55, which is better than the 0 44 at the beginning. Uh, here it gives you a sense of the demographics. Um, main point, I'm running out of time, but is that the dur duration of untreated psychosis is a skewed distribution. So you need to make adjustments. Uh, we use the square root adjustment. Uh, uh, the other key point is here on DUP to antipsychotic medication, less than 50% had a six month or less time period. And you had some folks past 10 years since the onset of their illness. Uh, main point is that we didn't get a reduction in the duration of untreated psychosis to antipsychotic medication. But this graph here, uh, this figure is, is about delay to any treatment, any treatment. So if they sought a primary care because of their psychotic illness, or if they went to a school counselor, or if they went to a chiropractor, again, based on this particular issue. So the first care. So the way we like to interpret it is that we see a reduction in the campaign period uh, to any care. We feel like we move the signal. We've got a ways to go to get to antipsychotic medication, but we think we know that the message was received. We moved the signal. Uh, and you can see the other key point is that foreign born folks, uh, had much larger duration of untreated psychosis, whether it's any treatment or actually the use of antipsychotic medication. I'll skip on this one. So the summary is that the message was delivered, received, the campaign may have contributed to a reduction in any treatment setting, but not in first antipsychotic medication and immigrants have a significantly longer DUP than US born Latinos. Uh, I'll skip over the Let's see, I'll just take one minute uh, to talk about future directions. Uh, one is we should prepare a year before launching the campaign. We hired the community educators about a month ahead of time. They spent six weeks getting to know the community. They already had some basis of connections with them. We should have started that a year ahead of time. It should be a three-year campaign instead of a two-year campaign. And by all means, it should be embedded, embedded with coordinated specialty care. I think had we had that, we would have been able to 
to move it towards uh, reduction in, in antipsychotic medication. So as we develop interventions for early psychosis, which is so important, let's not overlook low and middle income countries and let's not overlook communities of color. Coordinated specialty care alone may not be enough. We need science to guide the development of campaigns for our communities. And we're hopeful that with coordinated specialty care and campaigns specifically devoted to our underserved communities, we can reach out to those communities who need it the most. Colorín colorado, este cuento se ha acabado. Awesome. Stephen, thank you so much for a great talk, Dr. Lopez. This is, this is wonderful uh, to see. Uh, so people, please put uh, your comments and your questions in the chat. I see here Rebecca uh, indicating love the clave, real attention getter, plan to use something like that with my community, with my clients. Uh, there's a question here from Isabel. Uh, Leo, Leo, can I, could I interrupt you, please? Yeah, please uh, Rebecca, you can go to uselaclave.com and you can show your clients la película and la clase. You can look at it first. But the, the película is 15 minutes. The class is about 35 minutes, a little too, too long. But for a detailed look, that's how it's all constructed. Go to la clase. But for your clients, show them the película. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback. Sorry for interrupting that. Oh, no, no, no. That's great. That's great. I'm glad that these are great resources to share with our community. Yes, Stephen. So I have a question here from Isabel. Uh, Stephen, you mentioned low psychosis literacy in the Latinx population and the importance of learning how to describe psychosis in the culture. Did you notice any different ways Latinos describe psychosis that doesn't follow the usual DSM-5 or clinical orientation, uh, clinical definition of psychosis symptoms? Right? So I think the cultural differences of how uh, psychosis is expressed in the, in, in the diverse Latinx community. All right, that's a wonderful question. I remember in our early family research, I remember this one young lady who suffered from bipolar illness. And um, she wouldn't have, at that time, RDC, the research diagnostic uh, criteria. This was before DSM-3, I think. Uh, they said, engaged in, in uh, for a manic episode, uh, to engage in, in activities that have negative social consequences. They have driving speed violations. They had uh, sexual, uh, promiscuity, and they had something else. Well, this woman, her way of expressing mania was cleaning homes, cleaning homes. And had they used the criteria for identifying a manic episode, they may have overlooked it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one point. I do think that psychosis can be expressed differently. But we decided that we're going to use the particular criteria of psychosis as DSM represents, because we think that there are a lot of folks who aren't getting the attention uh, that they need. And so we use the traditional uh, psychotic kinds of symptomatology. But uh, Rebecca, that's a, uh, uh, that was a really good question. And, and I think we all have our own ideas of how the, the psychosis can be expressed differently. And Stephen, I have a question because you mentioned, I've seen uh, you talked about this and the importance of embedding a campaign like this within coordinated specialty care to, to make that link stronger. Any thoughts of how you're working or, or you see people doing that? Because that, that was one of the main uh, findings in the literature from the TIPS trial, that is really the supply and demand side, that you have, we have to combine both of those things. Uh, for, so any, any thoughts that you have uh, or, or thinking about how to take something like La Clave and embed it and, and coordinate better with coordinated specialty care. <laughs> so here's, here's a, a case. So Rosalba meets a father at La Clave and gives, her, gives him the brochure. And uh, he right away sees it and says, my son has these, these symptoms. And Rosalba said, call the 1-800 number. He then, a few days pass, and he texts Rosaba and say, this is going on, he's doing this. She says, call the 1-800 number. Finally, um, this happened two, three, four times. Finally, he calls the police. He got, the son got really aggressive, calls the police. And the police show up and he says, my son's abusing drugs, take him to a drug rehabilitation center. And the, the, the police say, we can take him to psychiatric hospital, we can take him to jail. 
no, he's doing drugs. Take him to, psych to uh, uh, the drug rehabilitation. Police said, nope, we can take him to jail or a psychiatric hospital. And then finally the police, because he, we had worked with the, these police officers, he says, at the psychiatric hospital, they have La Clave, La Clave. And he said, oh, I know about La Clave. And it's only then that he said, okay, take him to a psychiatric hospital. So one point is that I used to think that all we have to do is inform people of what the key symptoms of psychosis are, that it's a cognitive uh, intervention. No, what we're doing is we're planting seeds. We're initiating conversations. And the more people that are familiar with La Clave or psych psychotic symptoms, the greater likelihood is that people are gonna come to take the action that they need. Now, had, so it's no longer about a cognitive informational campaign. It's a community dialogue campaign, a community conversational campaign. Um, so had we worked within a mental health setting, we could have said, show up tomorrow and let's see what we can do with your son. But since we weren't working with them, we didn't work with therapists, we could only have our cases call folks and we, they couldn't do it. Right now we have a contract with Ventura County and we're training community-based organization representatives as well as clinicians about La Clave. And if you have clinicians who are informed about La Clave, they can then use it to teach their clients, their consumers about what psychosis is, but also they can make that connection from the community uh, if they had received that message and if the client had received that message in the community. So I like what we're doing in Ventura County right now because we're getting the word out to community agencies that are knowledgeable. They're gonna be able to go out and give community talks, but also they're gonna be familiar with it so that if they're not familiar with it and somebody's been exposed to it, um, there's not gonna be that connection. But if they are familiar and they mention La Clave, just like the police officer, it enhances trust. Because as you know, in these first episodes, a chaotic, difficult time. Uh, it's so challenging for all families. And so to have some common ground can be really useful. So that's one, think of it as a, initiating conversations and educating the clinic, uh, clinicians and staff, as well as community agency folks that might be helpful there. That's a, that's a great suggestion. And I, I, we, we do, we're doing some work in, in Santiago in Chile and they have done some, some of great work in primary care of training sort of the clinicians to help identify uh, people that are at high risk for psychosis to be able to, uh, to refer, but the, the campaign is what's missing as well. So I, I love this idea, uh, Stephen, of really looking at it from the community dialogue, but also the, uh, the providers also getting involved and understanding and, and making those connections. Right. In terms of training uh, the primary care providers, I think Helen Lester is her name. She's part of Max Bertrand's group. They did that same thing. You know, social medicine, primary care, train them. They did a really good job. Stigma reduction. They, they brought in folks with the uh, lived experience. They measured duration of untreated psychosis over here. Guess what happened? Nada. Nada. Why? Because you're not looking at those other pathways. Right. It's not just about the physician. Yeah. It has okay. to be a whole, all hands on deck in a sense of, of really understanding that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Nancy, any questions from your end? I'm, I'm, I'm reading some uh, components here, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I had a quick question as um, you were going through the presentation and I also had a chance to quickly glance at um, La Clave website. And I was just wondering how has the pandemic COVID-19 impacted the duration of untreated psychosis in the Latinx community or how has La Clave played a role? Yeah, uh, I don't know the answer to the question, I, actually to either of your questions. Um, but two, two comments I'd like to make is that uh, we had another contract with Kern County and we were with them when the pandemic began. And one of the things that uh, our contact person said is that attendance at sessions has increased considerably, uh, much less dropout and people are showing up. 
And so going remote is really important to enhance engagement of the treatment. And so I think that's a plus. The other thing we did is that um, we came up with uh, Doña Esperanza. We came up with a character called Doña Esperanza to give people esperanza and hope. And this was, the county said, can you do something right now to help people navigate these difficult waters? And essentially drew on behavioral activation, uh, which is a, an intervention for depression. Uh, we drew on behavioral activation that essentially says, if you engage in activities that are pleasing to you, you're going to reduce the distress in your lives. So we put on the internet, Doña Esperanza, we had three radio plugs. Uh, she helped somebody who was depressed, somebody who was anxious, and I forgot the third person. Um, maybe there are only two. And in a one minute radio uh, advertisement uh, that, that the project paid for, we put this uh, in addition, I was interviewed uh, for a more lengthy period of time. And uh, on our website, we have ways of going to mass, of exercising, yoga, Zumba, our, uh, our experience in, in the Latinx community, uh, women, Latinx women love Zumba. And we had Zumba classes, all this was online to help people navigate these difficult times. Did we measure anything? The only thing we measured were the number of hits that we got to our website. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we, that's, those are two responses to your questions and they don't completely answer your question. No, but I, but I love the, 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 the intent of really trying to reach out and help people cope with situation and provide them the resources. Now, that's actually really interesting. And that, that's, you know, before I was really into mechanisms, I was looking at clinical judgment bias. Are they the, what, what why might a clinician overdiagnose schizophrenia? Why might they underdiagnose major depression? Might it be their base rates? Might it be the attributions they make? Might it be their, um, 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 decision-making that's disconfirmatory, confirmatory hypothesis testing. And since then, I'm saying we know enough to bring the resources to make a difference in people's lives. Let's make sure those resources are there. And the mechanisms, yeah, that, those are important. And other people can do that. But in the little time I have left as a professional, I want to make sure that the available resources get to people as, yeah. as they need it as opposed to trying to polish and refine things. So Stephen, one last question, because I know we're running out of time. You've mentioned multiple times the different media that you have used. Can you right. talk a little bit about your, the thought process there of the, all the different media outlets that you do have used in your work? Because I thought that was also very interesting in, in moving this massive. Sure. I'll, I'll be, so I had a colleague Oh, here we go. Here's a toolkit. I had a colleague uh, who said, who gave out midway through abnormal psychology and uh, two, 300 people when we were at UCLA, when I was at UCLA. And he says, write down what I can do better. This is a large lecture. And this one student responded, don't tell me, show me. Don't tell me, show me. And that's always resonated with me. So with La Clave and Viva, we up with La Clave. Creencias falsas, let me show you. Mana, el muelle de San Blas. It's a song about a woman who has this delusion that her honey's going to come back. He never comes back. Lenguaje desorganizado, cantinflas, de una idea a otro. Uh, alucinaciones son by four. Uh, your Puerto Rican uh, group is no longer uh, together. But uh, Sofía, Sofía enloqueció cuando su mejor amiga la traicionó. Y se marchó con el amor de su vida. And se le ve tirando besos al aire como si hablara con alguien, pero a su lado no hay nadie. So, in, Tom Bauer describes very well hallucinations. So we use uh, these, uh, yeah. And then la clase, so we have used PowerPoints. Uh, we use artwork. We use Chespirito to bring in Lucas and Chaparron to talk about locura. Um, yeah, so show me, don't tell me. And then, then La Clase was uh, Alex Capelowitz, my colleague, got a grant from AstraZeneca, and we put it in the studio. 
And then seeing loose, I told you about that. Uh, we went and so we came up with this flip chart. It's about, it's, it's like a story like Elsa, but we, again, no words also, all pictures and low, low literacy in terms of reading and writing. And then the película, the thing about all of them is that it's embedded this attributional dilemma. Is it about a social issue, a, a problem in the home, a relationship, or is it about illness and the challenges in negotiating that attributional dilemma? Got it. I love that. Show me. Show me. Don't yeah, tell exactly. me. Uh, exactly. So this is a great way to end. Uh, Dr. Lopez, thank you so much for your time and your great presentation. These are excellent resources. Just a quick reminder, our next seminar will be October 26th from 12 to 1 p.m. And we have Dr. Rosauro Aguayo, who will present in partnerships and adaptation to implement trauma-focused therapy in low resource settings in the U.S. and Latin America. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. And we hope to see you next time. Uh, thank you so much. Gracias, Dr. Lopez. Gracias, Dr. Lopez. De nada, Nancy. De nada, Leo.